Morning. I call this uh, regular meeting of the Regional Transportation Committee for Tuesday, November 14th, 2023, to order. I'm your chair, Steve Conklin, and uh, you have taken attendance as we've done. Thank you very much. Do want to acknowledge we may have a couple of new folks joining us, Shelley Cook and Megan Vesquez, uh, commissioners uh, from CDOT, so we would welcome them. I will call your attention to the Regional Transportation Committee meeting summary. I would also ask if there's any public comment this morning. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll give it a second, but I do not see any hands raised online or in person. Thank you. Good to have everybody here. I had about a, a, a one minute stuck in elevator moment this morning, so I'm, I'm glad that, that you know, it, it's one of those mornings. We will move ahead with the informational briefings. The first is the Regional Transportation Committee orientation. Attachment B in your packet, Jacob Rigger, Manager of Multimodal Transportation Planning. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning, everyone. Um, since we do have a couple of new faces and it's been a while since we've done this, we thought it would be timely to do a relatively, <clears throat> excuse me, relatively brief orientation, um, a little bit about Dr. Cog, but mostly about our transportation planning function and about this committee, the Regional Transportation Committee, which is um, our MPO planning committee. So um, hopefully you all know about Dr. Cog, um, <laughs> but we are one of the oldest and largest and most diverse councils of government in the country. Uh, we cover a vast area, as you know, and as you can see on the map. Uh, we wear a lot of hats and we have a lot of designations, both federal and state designations, and we'll get into a few of those as we go through um, the presentation. Um, but a couple of the big ones are, we are by state statute, a regional planning commission. Um, by federal designation, we are the Metropolitan Planning Organization uh, for the Greater Denver Area, and that's most germane uh, to our work here on the Regional Transportation Committee. Um, Dr. Cog is also the area agency on aging for most of the region. Um, Boulder County and Wealth County have their own uh, area agencies on aging as well. And along with our designations, we also deal with a lot of boundaries. Um, our Dr. Cog boundary, um, our MPO boundary, our air quality non-attainment boundary, and some others, and some of those are illustrated on the map uh, there as well. I'll let this animate through, but really just you know, to make the point, um, Dr. Cog and this region really rely on partnerships. We are our partnerships. We are our relationships we are our ability to work together as different agencies for the betterment of this region. That's the philosophy of Dr. Cog. I think that's the philosophy of all of us in this room. <clears throat> our sum is greater than, um, greater than our parts, absolutely, in this region. So particularly to Dr. Cog, we are for the most part not a regulator. Uh, for the most part, we don't build things or operate things with some exceptions. Um, we are a planning agency, right? We are a convener. Uh, we provide policy guidance. We bring people together. We set priorities. We distribute funding. Um, we produce data. Uh, we do lots of things, but again, in the realm of partnerships, um, collaboration, and convening. So our planning framework at Dr. Cog that helps us do that. Um, our Metro Vision Plan, which is our aspirational uh, plan for this region, what does this region want to be as we continue to evolve and mature over time, somewhat analogous to a local government's comprehensive plan. A big implementer of the Metro Vision Plan is our Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan, uh, which I'll talk about in a couple slides, and that's our, also our federally required multimodal long-range transportation plan. Um, I think you all are very familiar, and that includes, by the way, I should mention not just our vision for transportation in the region, but per federal requirements, what can this region actually afford to invest in um, and, and build and operate and maintain over time? And we call that a uh, federal term fiscally constrained or cost feasible regional transportation plan. And then you all are familiar with the Transportation Improvement Program, and I will talk more about that in a couple slides. Oh, and I should, I don't want to give short shrift that um, this is all in the lens of one of our other many federal requirements, the fact that we are um, a non-attainment area for air quality in this region and that our plans address um, and work towards bettering air quality um, in, in the greater Denver region. 
Um, so at the federal level, we have some federally directed responsibilities. You know, we all think of the bipartisan infrastructure law as a law that funds projects and all the discretionary grant programs, and it does, and that's really important. But from an MPO perspective, what the bipartisan infrastructure law and its predecessors actually do is lay out our requirements, um, our metropolitan planning framework and, and federal requirements as a metropolitan planning um, organization. So all the things that we're required to do, we would do them anyway, of course, but all the things that we're required to do um, under federal law actually come from that transportation authorization, which is, you know, the current iteration is bipartisan infrastructure law. Um, most importantly, from that federal perspective, as I said, we are the designated Metropolitan Planning Organization, MPO, for the greater Denver region. Dr. Cog is the designated MPO agency. You are the MPO planning process. The MPO planning process is really about bringing together uh, the MPO, uh, the state DO team, and the regional transit agency. So together, this committee, and I'll talk more about this committee in a few slides, you are the MPO planning process. Under state law, um, several things. Uh, we are the regional planning commission for this area. Uh, we are empowered to make and adopt regional plans. Um, some things we've gotten involved in recently that we've talked a lot about in this committee over the last year and a half is the state greenhouse gas uh, transportation planning standard, the greenhouse gas reduction rule. That's a new state requirement for us. Uh, we also have a couple legislative things that currently aren't as visible as they have been over the years, but under legislation, uh, we must approve any fixed guideway transit system proposed by the Regional Transportation District before construction can proceed. That comes from Senate Bill 9208. Um, another bill from the General Assembly, whose number I don't remember, um, <laughs> talks about the same thing from a roadway tolling perspective, that actually, Dr. Cog, we review roadway tolling proposals for inclusion in our fiscally constrained regional transportation plan um, under state law. And then obviously, of course, um, Dr. Cog has a seat at the table of the statewide transportation advisory committee, better known as STAP. So as a metropolitan planning organization, I said you all are the embodiment of our MPO planning process. Um, under federal law, it's known as 3C, but basically that means continuing cooperative and comprehensive performance-based transportation planning process. That is ultimately our mandate under federal law. Um, and again, we bring together Dr. Cog as the Council of Governments, CDOT, and RTD as the Regional Transit Agency, along with the other partners, RAC, and other partners to fulfill our MPO planning obligations for this region. And in doing so, we produce all of these products that you see here, um, a couple of which I'm going to touch on. One you're actually going to hear about today, the congestion management process. Um, and we've talked a lot about the regional transportation plan, transportation improvement program, uh, but all of these things um, are things that we work on. They're required by federal law, but they're things that we do together for this region to advance multimodal transportation planning. Um, so along with being an MPO and a regional planning commission um, and an area agency on aging, there's many things that Dr. Cog as an agency does beyond the things I've already touched on. I'm not going to go through all these individually, but I do want you to know, because sometimes we don't talk about these things as much, but they're there and they're available. We produce a tremendous amount of data. Uh, we do a lot of scenario planning, particularly in the context of our regional transportation plan. Uh, we're starting up new programs, as, as I think you know, around corridor and sub-area community planning. Um, Pretty unique for, uh, for an MPO to have a uh, traffic operations program and signal timing. Uh, we have a whole um, set of folks who work on that, um, again, which is a unique function across the country. Uh, transportation demand management, our way to go program, bike to work day, uh, which all of you are familiar with. In our regional traffic count program database, all these and others are things that Dr. Cog is an agency works with you on, uh, produces leads in the region, resources available for our collective work together. Um, so again, I've sort of, you know, emphasized this point, but can't emphasize it enough. It really is um, all about partnerships. Federal law sets up metropolitan planning organization, you know, MPO planning, the MPO, and our work together as a cooperative um, partnership planning process. That's what we believe in, and that's how we try to work with you uh, together again for the betterment of this region, you and all the other partners listed here. 
So real quickly, some very specific things that we work on, and I've touched on these, and I think you're generally familiar with them. Um, the most important thing we do, in my opinion, just you know, because I used to manage it, um, but it really is important because it, <laughs> it sets the priorities, it sets the framework for our work together, is the regional transportation plan. And what's really unique about it is that it brings together, regardless of funding source, regardless of ownership, regardless of operator, regardless of jurisdiction, every mode of transportation in this region whether it's local roadways that local you know local streets that local governments work on whether it's the E470 or our other toll highway authorities CDOT RTD all the funds that we distribute through our transportation improvement program we bring all of that together into our long range multimodal transportation plan it is one of our foundational documents that really sets the framework of priorities in this region particularly through our fiscally constrained component of it of our regional transportation plan. What's important to this region? What are we going to fund together? What are we going to invest in together over time? And then one of the key implementers of the regional transportation plan is the transportation improvement program. I think almost all of you are familiar with it, but it's analogous to a local government um, local government's capital improvement program, and CDOT has its own version, um, both of us under federal law, the MPO's transportation improvement program, CDOT's statewide transportation improvement program, which under federal law also need to be consistent with each other. All of these documents, but specific to our transportation improvement program, really sort of uh, talk about their short-term documents that really talk about what are we building, funding, investing, and constructing now um, over the next four years? And the TIP is really the vehicle in which, at the Dr. Cog level, the MPO level, we invest the dollars that we control that you see listed here, um, these particular funding sources. Surface Transportation Block Grant, uh, CMAC, um, as it's better known, but Congestion Mitigation Air Quality. Uh, multimodal Options Fund, state funding source, the new carbon, Federal Carbon Reduction Program, and the Transportation Alternatives Program. Um, is primarily what we fund through our TIP. We do this by funding studies and projects and specific investments in the TIP, and we do that every four years. As most of you know, we just finished uh, a really major cycle for our new four-year TIP, uh, four funding calls altogether for our existing and new TIP. But we also, in addition to specific investments and specific projects, have what we call TIP set-asides. And these are funding amounts that are dedicated for very specific things, like transportation demand management, human service transportation, corridor planning, and several others. So again, I kind of touched on our work together as an MPO um, and, our, um, and how we're structured together and how we work together. Uh, we very recently updated our framework for transportation planning in the Denver region. This really is a transportation planning 101 document. Um, I would encourage all of you to look at it. It's in plain English. It's meant to just very clearly and plainly explain what is our transportation planning process together, what are the requirements, what are the products and the processes um, that we use together to conduct transportation planning in this region. Under federal law, we also have a metropolitan planning agreement that is signed by the three MPO agencies, again, Dr. Cog, CDOT, and RTD. And it requires that, and we have kind of a unique structure here in this region, it requires in part that the Dr. Cog board, which is the ultimate approver of the documents and the things that we do at Dr. Cog as the MPO, our board and this committee, the Regional Transportation Committee, actually need to concur on the actions that you take regarding our MPO planning documents and processes. So again, you are MPO committee, our board is our ultimate sort of approver um, sort of body. So whenever we bring the regional transportation plan or the transportation improvement program or other MPO related documents to you, this committee and our board have to take the same action. And in my 13 years in Dr. Cog, I can only count maybe less than five times, a handful of times when there's been a little bit of difference in those actions you know, maybe one body makes an amendment to a document that the other didn't or whatever it is. When that happens, then it comes back to both committees so that ultimately we can reconcile and again, both the RTC and the board take the same action. And you can see that structure over on the right, the Dr. Cog Board of Directors, um, the, this committee, the Regional Transportation Committee, and then we have a Technical Transportation Advisory Committee, which brings together our local governments, our partner agencies, and our subject matter experts um, to help us in our transportation planning process. We also, as you can see at the bottom, have occasional kind of ad hoc um, kind of work groups, um, subject matter groups that we convene as needed to help us work through specific things. So specifically related to um, this committee, the Regional Transportation Committee, um, really I'd say your responsibilities in my characterization really a couple things. 
Um, you do at least two. You do many important things, but I'd boil it down to two things. One is that you review, again, the products and the processes of the MPO planning process. Our Transportation Advisory Committee will make a recommendation to you um, on specific things, documents, plans, things that we're working on. You will review those, and you will, in turn, make a recommendation to our board. That's a, and that's what you do most of the time in this committee. But also, I want to, you know, I want to sort of recognize the work that you do in the third bullet. Um, you do provide guidance and support, and frankly, you're a champion for us um, on several issues that we work on, particularly safety. Um, this committee, over the years, you have been a real champion, um, a real encourager uh, for us in the arena of safety and Vision Zero. Um, but you really sort of um, provide that guidance to us. Um, again, this is a unique committee bringing together the folks who are in the room today and the agencies you represent. There isn't another committee like this, um, and so you really help us in our transportation planning process. Um, just a couple more slides. Um, so who are you? Who are you on the Regional Transportation Committee? Um, you are representatives, a subset of the Dr. Cog Board, the CDOT Transportation Commission, um, and the RTD Board of Directors. Um, the RAC Executive Director is here um, and is a member of the committee. And then we have three subject matter experts that help us, you know, folks who are experts in um, kind of fields related to transportation, nexus of transportation. Um, there are three of those seats on this committee that help um, this committee's work. Um, as you know, the chair and vice chair of this committee are the chair and vice chair of the Dr. Cog Board. You have 17 members total on this committee. And I think this is important, and we structured it this way in our committee guidelines on purpose, the quorum for this committee is 12 members, but it includes at least two members each from the three foundational agencies. Again, this is a partnership. This is a collaboration. We never wanted a situation where all the members from two of the agencies show up, but not the third agency. That's not how we operate. We are a partnership, and our quorum recognizes uh, the foundation of the three MPO agencies in this committee. Uh, so a quorum is 12 members, and voting is also 12 votes to carry an action. So this is my last slide. This was Doug Rex after his first week at Dr. Cog many years ago. <laughs> Maybe my last day at Dr. Cog, so it's been a pleasure working with you all. But as you all move forward in your work, um, I'm not going to go through these issues individually, but the point here is that I hope you see, I hope you recognize in seeing these issues, things that your agency works on, um, that you hopefully you would agree that these are kind of the big issues. These are the regional priorities that all of our agencies work on together. These are the hard issues that we all wrestle with, um, but that we all work collaboratively to address both in this forum as the Regional Transportation Committee and our MPO work, but as our individual agencies and as partners together. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. That's great information, a good reminder uh, to, I think, all of us. So, questions, comments? It was that awesome. There are no questions or comments. Thank you very much. Appreciate Thank your you. time. That was the applause because you think it may be his last day at Dr. <laughs> <laughs> We'll move ahead to item number five, the 2022 annual report on roadway traffic congestion in the Denver region. And we have Max Monk, assistant planner, sir. Good morning, Robert Spots uh, with the Denver Regional Council of Governments. I will introduce Max Monk here in just one second, but just a brief introduction. First of all, we're very ha happy to have Max here. He's done the bulk of this work and we'll do the bulk of the presenting, but I'll take all the credit. Um, <laughs> Uh, just a few uh, questions for you all. Um, who, th so first, actually, first of all, this is a 2022 annual report. We do these every year. It's a federal requirement, but things are changing a little bit more quickly now as we move out of the pandemic here. So the, the place setting back to 2022, uh, reminded Dr. Cog actually didn't come back to the office until April 1st of 2022. Um, it's a requirement. And we were wearing masks for the majority of 2022 in the office. So things were quite different then. We think travel was different, more different then than it is today. But I am curious, still today uh, in 2023, how many of you are still kind of traveling differently than you were in 2019? And getting things, food, good services delivered to your home in different ways than you were before 2019? Also curious, today, do you feel like congestion is worse or, or about the same level as 2019 today? stuff. Uh, so this, we use this report as an opportunity to kind of keep tabs on trends uh, in mobility and travel in this region. 
Max will talk about 2022. Again, a very different year than we're experiencing today. Excited to look at the 2023 data when we get there, but lots of interesting stories from 2022. And with that, I'll introduce Max Monk. And thank you, Robert. Let's make sure I know how this works. Okay, cool. Good morning, everybody. My name is Max Monk, and I'm an assistant planner, part of the Mobility Analytics Program. This is my first chance getting to, to speak with and present to you all today, and I'm really excited to be here. So I'm here to talk to you about the 2022 annual report on traffic congestion in the region. Um, Jacob mentioned this in his presentation, um, but this report is part of a congestion management process, or a CMP. This process is federally required to monitor the evolution of congestion in the region across time. Um, Dr. Cog's process has a couple of different components, uh, first being a database of roadway attributes, so things like uh, how many lanes are on a facility, how many traffic signals, so on and so forth. Um, we keep record of traffic counts, so the uh, amount of volume on a facility, crash incidents, and then multimodal data metrics, so, so things like transit ridership, shared micromobility usage, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, we take these and form it into our second component, which is the annual report on congestion, which is what we're here to talk about today. Uh, to provide an overview of what we hope to cover, I'm going to throw a lot at you guys, so I apologize in advance. Um, we'll start with the, the trends and observations that we observed in 2022. Um, so we'll touch on vehicle miles traveled, transit ridership, shared micromobility usage. Um, we'll talk about if business as usual from the, the data that we, we saw last year, if it continues into 2050, what do we expect congestion to look like? Um, we'll talk about the shifting kind of dynamics of commute corridors. Uh, Robert asked you a lot of questions. That was sort of to frame for, for this, this component of the presentation. And then lastly, we wanted to, to try something new this time around and see what's happening in the rest of the nation in the realm of congestion to, uh, to, to connect you all to the most recent and relevant information. So to, to start with those trends and observations. So VMT, vehicle miles traveled, uh, represents the total mileage traveled on our roads in the region on a given day. So this is a daily metric. Um, from 2000 to 2022, VMT has generally increased. Um, we've seen a lot of population growth in the region, um, and, and this is reflected in the level of travel that we see as well. Um, there are a couple of points where it's waned or, or decreased, notably during the recession period, as well uh, as a, a pretty stark decrease of about 15% in, uh, when, the, when the pandemic began in 2020. Um, but between 2020 and 2021, we did see uh, VMT recover um, pretty starkly. Um, but between 2021 and 2022, we only saw 1% growth in VMT, and this su surprised us. So in terms of the mileage traveled on our roadways, um, we, we were still not at those 2019 pre-pandemic levels. We also take a look at VMT as it relates to our region's population, so VMT per capita. Um, and you'll notice it follows a lot of the same, same trends, dynamics as, as the standard VMT metric. Um, notably, we do have a, a goal in our MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan of 23 VMT per capita. Um, we are still above that goal, but because of the pandemic and, um, you know, while, while a lot of negative effects have been born, we're, we're hopeful we can leverage, um, you know, some of that into to better travel behavior outcomes um, in terms of, of this target. So to, to shift focus, um, we, we talked about the, the vehicle travel on, on our roadways, and, and now I want to touch on transit ridership in our region. Um, this chart will look a little bit different. It represents um, average daily transit ridership um, across each month. Um, and it, it uses 2019 as a baseline, so that, that blue line that you see on screen represents um, 2019 as a baseline, and the orange is, uh, is a percent difference in transit ridership. So in, when the pandemic began in 2020, from, from March to April, you see a really strong decrease, and it sort of ebbed and flowed as it's, as it's grown and, and, and tried to recover. Um, some, some dynamics um, influencing the ridership's struggle to, to recover include, um, you know, we have differences in, in service. We have some, some less service levels in our region um, across our transit network. We have more people teleworking, and, uh, you know, we, we still have some public health concerns among, among um, you know, certain populations. 
Notably, in 2022, we did have the pilot of Zero Fare for Better Air, which did see the highest point of transit ridership following the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and notably, we, we do have additional data in 2023, um, and, and we do see that the ridership is continuing to increase, but we wanted to keep an apples-to-apples comparison um, for, for all these modes that we're looking at and, and keep the focus on 2022. The shift to, to shared micromobility. So, so this refers to, to devices that are smaller than an automobile. Think um, shared bikes, shared scooters. Um, these can have stations or be dockless. I, I'm sure that, that many of you have seen um, or have a, a picture in your mind of what this looks like, um, especially downtown and in other pockets of the region. Um, so, so the chart on screen represents the average number of micromobility trips per day, excuse me. Um, and we saw roughly 4,300 per day in 2019. And that's, that's pretty strongly grown, which is different from our VMT and transit uh, data. So in fact, you know, ridership in this, this mode has tripled. Um, so we recognize this, this isn't a, a silver bullet for congestion per se, um, but we're, we're excited to see this grow. It's an additional choice for people it provides, um, you know, a, a good first mile, last mile benefit um, that, that's, that, that's typically borne by for, for transit. Um, so, you know, we're, we're excited to see this continue to increase. So to shift our focus back to our, uh, our roadway system and, and specifically freeways, we were really interested um, where, where the, the highest degree of magnitude um, of congestion exists in, in our region and, and where, where is it most severe? And uh, through internal discussion and, and what we've heard externally, we, we looked at a handful of different corridors um, and we wanted to showcase uh, the, the couple that, that really told the most interesting story. And it probably doesn't surprise um, many of you, uh, the, the corridors that are on screen. So we have I-25 from I-70 to University Boulevard in green and I-270 in its entirety in orange. These corridors represent 3% of our freeway network length. And despite this, um, they, they hold or bear roughly 22% of delay on, in our, our freeway network. So delay represents a, a noticeable slowdown, stop and go traffic where you're, you're delayed from a, a more expected reasonable travel time. Um, and another way to look at this is, you know, roughly one out of every five minutes spent in stop and go traffic happens on one of these two corridors. Um, so we thought that was really interesting and, and wanted to call that out. Shift focus and look at, um, you know, what what do we expect congestion to look like in 2050? And this is especially if the data from 2022 continue on into the future, sort of business as usual. Um, it's important to note, you know, 2050 is a far, far way away. No one predicted the pandemic. A lot can change in, in that level of time. Um, so, you know, this is just one possible future. And it's, it's important to, you know, take this with a, with a grain of salt of sorts. Um, but we like to look at the, the same sort of metrics. Um, so vehicle miles traveled per capita, as I mentioned um, prior, we're, we're expecting that to grow to 27 miles per day. And that's, that's compared to the target that we mentioned of right around 23 miles per day. Uh, every year we calculate a, a rough estimate of the cost of congestion, considering things like fuel spent idling, um, people's time um, being spent in traffic compared to more productive means, um, so on and so forth. And, and we use this really to gauge how, how that, that changes across time. And um, between last year and, and 2050, we're, we're expecting that to increase by 67%. Uh, for, for some of you who've been part of this committee for, for some time, the, the, um, the graphic on screen probably looks familiar, but it, it does remain true. Uh, congestion at 2 p.m. in 2050 is expected to, to look and feel a lot like congestion did at 5 p.m. in 2022. So we're, we're seeing, um, or rather expecting, congestion to, to shift temporally. Um, we're expecting our, our peak period, so that, that evening rush hour, to to, to shift more into the early afternoon. So to, to provide some context on where, where this all exists uh, spatially. Um, so I can't tell how hard it is for you to see uh, from your perspective, but the red lines on screen represent corridors that we identified as congested in 2022. Um, we see a lot of I I-25, I-270, I-225, as, as well as a lot of core arterials like Federal, Sheridan, Wadsworth, so on and so forth. 
Um, in 2050, those orange lines represent uh, additional corridors we expect to be congested should dynamics and trends can continue. Um, and you'll, you'll notice a lot more freeways, more of I-25 to the north and the south, as well as uh, uh, many additional arterials. So every year we, we, we try to do a, a special topic based on the data and trends we observe, as well as you know, what, what was interesting in, in the year that we're looking at. And you know, the pandemic continues to, to influence travel behavior in the region, and uh, this, this sort of framed our analysis this year. Um, as you're, you're all aware, telework became a public health necessity during the pandemic, um, and it, it remains really prevalent and frequent following, um, following those worst impacts. And this is especially the case for, for people who have historically commuted into an office environment. This led us to the research question, uh, have the dynamics on these historic commute corridors, have they shifted? Um, are, we, are we seeing fewer trips being taken places? Are we seeing congestion shifting? Um, and, and we wanted to, to look at this and, and examine you know, different travel time and traffic volume data, both prior to the pandemic and in 2022. Kept this focus on our freeway system so we, we, we looked at a, a number of different corridors and are, are going to highlight the three that we, we think tell the most interesting stories. Um, we have the Lakewood to downtown Denver um, corridor along US 6, Highlands Ranch to the Denver Tech Center, and then Mid Aurora to the Denver International Airport. And we identify these all as, as primary commute um, corridors uh, between these two destinations um, for each. So that morning commute from Lakewood to Denver um, in, in 2019, to start with that travel time variable, um, it, it would take you an average of 11 minutes to, to travel that corridor end to end. Um, and in 2022, it, it took you an average of nine minutes. So that's a 14% a decrease in travel time and as such a, a decrease in that stop and go delay. Um, two minutes might not feel like a lot, but that, that's multiplied across all of the, the vehicles that we see on that facility. So that, that's multiplied across uh, tens of thousands of vehicles. Um, so, so there are, there's more stable, um, st stable travel flow occurring on this corridor, but when considering volume, so then the number of vehicles on the facility, um, we, we actually see that we're about the, at the same level on this corridor as 2019. So, um, so we have the same, same number of trips being taken, but, but more stable tra travel speeds. Um, so what, what this shows us is that. You know, telecommuting and flexible schedules are probably a pretty key explanation here. People are, are probably working from home. Uh, they, they might be taking trips at different times of day because their schedule allows them to. Um, so so we're, we're seeing some changes on this corridor. From Mid Aurora to the Denver airport um, in 2019, it, it would take you an average of 25 minutes to travel this corridor to end to end. And um, in 2022, it was the exact same. Um, the airport notably had a, a record number of passengers in 2022. Uh, we, we saw a lot of growth in housing and jobs. Um, so, and, and you know, we expect that to continue. Um, looking at volume, we, we actually saw during the busier travel months, like around the holidays, we actually saw more, more volume on, on this corridor. So by all accounts, we, we feel this corridor is back. Um, so, and, and really to, to frame that in a larger context, even though VMT and the vehicle miles traveled is not at pre-pandemic levels, some corridors are, um, and, and we expect this, this corridor to, to continue to grow into the future. And then lastly, the Highlands Ranch to Denver Tech Center corridor. Um, and I, in 2019, it took you an average of 23 minutes, and in 2022, it took you an average of 18 minutes. So similar to that Lakewood corridor, we see a decrease in travel time and delay. Um, but different than the Lakewood corridor, we, we're actually seeing a lot less volume on this this, this facility. So, um, so we we know we feel that because there there are less trips being taken, telework is probably some component here. But we we also do acknowledge the C470 managed lane came online during this period, and uh, that could be pulling some vehicles off of the general purpose lanes, which would make for for a more stable flow of traffic. So. Next, to, to pause and frame this a bit, we wanted to, to take a look at you know, what, what's occurring in, in the rest of the nation in the realm of congestion. And we, we 
looked at a lot of different stories and wanted to share the, the few that we thought held the most interesting information and, um, you know, would, would keep you informed and, and sort of, you know, they're, they're pivotal in what we expect to come in the future. So first, we have the discussion of communication between smartphones and traffic signals in Dallas, Texas. The production of a micro model allowing planners to look at congestion live in Chattanooga or a digital twin. And then this one's garnered some media attention, so I wouldn't be surprised if, if some of you have, have seen this one, but the implementation of congestion pricing for streets south of 60th Street in, in Manhattan and New York City. Start with that Dallas example. Um, you know, to, to, to preface, smartphones have, have become very ingrained in our lives, right? Um, you know, and this is, this is especially true in the realm of navigation as well. Um, you know, we, we plug destinations into our map. We, it'll, it'll show us where it expects slowdowns to occur in, a, in the form of a red or an orange line. Um, and that's because other people have phones and are, are experiencing it. So smartphones network with each other. They, they know where congestion exists. And Dallas is, is thinking about and considering upgrading their traffic signals to tap into this network. So when, when devices pass, pass below a uh, traffic light, uh, it would provide them with information. And, and they're hoping this would enable more efficient traffic management. Um, but they're, they're, they notably haven't taken any action here. This is all just, just dialogue in Dallas. In Chattanooga, Tennessee, um, yeah, through machine learning and real-time data, researchers from the National Renewable Energy Lab and Department of Energy created a micromodel mirroring Chattanooga traffic conditions with precision. So they did this similar to, to the previous example, um, using cell phone device data as well as connected vehicle data. Um, but they also employed uh, like on, on street sensors to, to provide um, data where, where there may be gaps. Um, this is known as a digital twin, and it enabled planners to under, understand the underlying causes of congestion and pinpoint specific areas of improvement. Uh, to our understanding, these um, once, once using this, this digital twin, planners employed some, some different strategies to mitigate congestion, and researchers observed a 32% reduction in delay and a 16% reduction in fuel spent idling. So um, those, are, those are pretty, pretty strong impacts. And NREL and the DOE are notably trying to scale this up and bring it to other regions. So this is something we'll certainly keep an eye on and um, you know, look into as it moves into the future. And then lastly, uh, in New York City, they are uh, considering congestion pricing. The city, state of New York, and Federal Highway Administration recently approved a cordon zone in the Central Business District for streets below 60th Street in Manhattan. And, and what this, this will do, it will enact a toll for all personal and commercial vehicles um, that enter this space. So it doesn't charge people for driving in the facility, uh, or in the, the zone rather, um, but, but it's a one-time fee that they, they pay when they enter. Tolls will range from a low of $5 per driver overnight to a high of $23 per driver during peak periods. Uh, they're notably aiming to accommodate lower income drivers by providing a 25% discount. And after 10 tolls are paid or 10 trips, this will increase to 50%. Um, notably, they, they have not released what, what threshold they're expecting for lower income. Um, so, so that is still to be determined. Um, the city uh, feels that this will reduce VMT in this space. It'll shift vehicles to um, more auto-centric facilities like freeways and thoroughfares, which won't be charged the toll. And they feel it will encourage um, people to use other modes of transportation, to walk, to bike, to take transit, um, which, which will not be, be tolled. Um, and then lastly, they, they feel it, it will be a good new revenue source to, to support MTA, their transit agency. And to, to sort of wrap this whole section up, um, you know, we're, we're, we as staff aren't advocating for any of these, these policies or premises, right? We're just taking a look at what's happening in, in the nation and wanting to keep you all as informed as possible um, as, as we move into the future. So to wrap up, I'm so sorry, I threw so much at you all today, so thanks for your patience, but you know, we do expect congestion to intensify moving into the future, um, but at the same time, we're doing a lot of really good work. We have Denver Region ITS working to make our signal network more efficient to, uh, to help you know, have more stable traffic flow. 
we're working with the state here at Dr. Cog to um, undertake a, a new household travel survey to, to connect us with new information to help us better understand um, changing travel behaviors. And it will also allow us to, to calibrate our model um, so it, it's more precise and, and to date. We're doing transportation demand management. We have way to go. Um, that, that's shifting single occupancy vehicle trips um, into multimodal trips, taking vehicles off of the road. And then here at Dr. Cog and in many of our member agencies, we're, we're undertaking a lot of projects that are, you know, creating additional travel choices so people can avoid the worst impacts of congestion. So, um, you know, 2050, again, it's, it's only um, one possible scenario, but we're doing a lot of great work. And, and you know, I'm optimistic we, we can move the needle on this issue. So with that, I'm, I'm happy to take any, any comments or questions. That's a great presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, Director Williams. Is it working? Yay. Um, that was a great presentation with a lot of really good information. I have a whole page full of notes that I might ask some later. But the thing I wanted to ask now, I, I heard, or I think I heard, that Apple is changing its data reporting so that people can block their phones from giving that kind of data. Um, are we looking at how that's going to affect this kind of information? Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, that isn't something that popped up in our research, but um, that's something we'll look into. And you know, it's it's tough because private companies they get they can do do what they want with that data, right? Um, so we can also derive pretty good samples with, I, you know, I'm sure that not every phone provider will will restrict their data. So I don't know. We'll we'll continue to monitor that moving into the future. Welcome, Shelley Cook. Thank you very much. Um, okay, uh, do you ever break down or do you incorporate uh, an analysis by age group for your travel patterns in terms of your projections and also planning purposes for investments? I'm thinking of me, um, you know, I'm one of those people you're probably characterizing, but um, by the time an improvement that you plan gets done, I probably will use it only for 10 years or something, hopefully more, but Austin here will use it for decades longer. So are we waiting <laughs> Austin's patterns? <laughs> appropriately, I guess. Is what yeah, that, that's something we're increasingly looking at as a program. Um, there are a lot of really neat and cool data sets coming out that we're, we're monitoring that allow us to, to look pretty intentionally at how travel behaviors are changing across demographic. Um, and, um, you, you know, the data, we're still sort of betting a lot of this, um, but it's something we're, we're really considering. And um, right now we're really relying on the insights that, that we hear in public comment and in, in a lot of the engagement that we do as an agency, but, um, but yeah, no, we'll, we'll continue to, to look at that. Do you have any? That our, our travel model, which is where a lot of these projections come from, certainly takes into account all those demographic. Very morning, we were looking at why, one of the reasons that the capita may be increasing in the future, and one of those reasons is that there's going to be about 4% less children in our demographic estimates, so there's far more people of driving age in 50 at by DMT per capita, one of the reasons. Dr. Broom. When you look at, there we go. When you look at Pena Boulevard, when it first opened up, it was like 99% of the traffic was going to the airport. Now, I suspect that most of the growth of the traffic on that is coming from subdivisions up and up. So how do you deal with that? Yeah, we, we have to take a number of different variables into consideration, right? And and a lot of those um, do look at, at land use in, in our model, and we, we have a land use model as well. Um, and, yeah, I, I don't – Robert, do you have more to Again, you know, the, the travel model, we, we do anticipate a large amount of growth in that area, and that's taken into account in the future, number of trips, and the surrounding facilities, right? For the, for the base year, we're actually using kind of real data, real-time data, um, big data to estimate speeds, and yet already that growth is impacting that facility, certainly, along with Denver is now the third barriest, biggest, busiest airport in the world, ton of passengers going through there, accessing that facility through. Finally, Denver, 
I mean, it's the god awfulest mess to drive in now compared to maybe three or four years ago. Uh, we we look at the the region through a pretty holistic context. Um, I, I I do know Denver is you know is, it, it, they're certainly looking at their downtown, um, be it for for land use and and um, you know things like recovery for the pandemic. Um, they'll they'll be looking at at how travel behavior changes downtown um, certainly, but. Um, we haven't taken a, a strong look in 2022 data at downtown. We were, we're pretty centered on, um, you know, where are we seeing um, those commute changes, especially into office spaces since tel telework is, is, is becoming more prevalent. That, that was our focus this year. Thank you. Director Ward. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I guess one question I have in at this presentation is we're modeling for congestion and where people are going and trying to figure out VMTs and whatnot. Does that modeling for the future also include what does alternative modes of transportation look like? What does our increase in public transit need to look like? Our miles for uh, bike infrastructure, pedestrian infrastructure to ensure that if we are going to, and we should be, reducing our vehicle miles travel, that there is also a, at least a one-for-one one increase in alternative modes of transportation's ability to take on those people. Does that modeling fit in what you guys are doing right now, or is that something that needs to be added in? Yes, it, it does. Um, to, to provide a high-level point first, um, yeah, our, our modeling accounts for everything that we have in our regional transportation plan. That includes active transportation projects, that includes uh, new transit, um, and it does uh, project changes in um, active transportation usage and transit ridership. Just, just to add on, um, we have a lot of products here at Dr. Cog, active transportation plans. This is a federally acquired um, program that does focus on congestion, bend it quite far away from that frequently, <laughs> keeping tabs on a lot of mobility issues. But congestion is a major concern for, I would say. That said, yes, Dr. Cog does provide heavy investments in, I would say, above one to one growth in public transit use compared to the amount of the higher growth rates in bicycling and pedestrian to VM. Partially because congestion becomes so severe, those other modes do become more attractive. Well, I'll just, this isn't so much a, a question, although it may, may lead to an answer, uh, more of an editorial statement. I, I, I was amazed to see the increase in micromobility. I mean, that's just absolutely incredible, and that's awesome. It also poses a challenge for municipalities and for others in terms of, of what does that influx of those micro-mobility devices do for congestion, the downtown Denver issue, I think that plays in. And then also, you know, in, in my community, for instance, we're doing great work at, at, at improving handicap ramps, improving sidewalks, and then you have those micro-mobility devices that tend to park exactly in the middle and I don't know if they if they measure, but it it it, it, it it's absolutely amazing the number. And even driving in this morning, the number of, of sidewalks that were blocked by those micro mobility devices. So there's got to be some intentionality with 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 looking at those public private partnerships and the mixed blessing that something like that provides. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that that's something that we've seen and heard from a lot of agencies, right, um, about, about sort of, you know, humans are imperfect creatures. They'll, they'll leave things where they want to sometimes. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think, you know, here at Dr. Cog, we have space to really talk about that across our region, um, and that's, that's something local agencies continue to grapple with as they expand those partnerships. Okay. Thank you. Director Moldy. Hi, I'm from uh, Douglas County in, a, in an area that doesn't have RTD or micromobility options, and that's a matter of uh, regional and local population and government choices. So what I'm, I'd like to understand is how we use the data and studies that you have to benefit these large growing areas in small towns that don't have these facilities, even though they're the focus and they're what reduce, how do we how do we 
serve the needs of areas that don't have that? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a that's a tough question to answer at times, right? Um, and you know, our focus is, especially for this process, is very high level, looking at you know how where congestion shifts where it exists in the region and that that does tend us to to lead to some some pretty core you know freight corridors commute corridors um and you know all that that we can really do i think um with with the data that, that we have on hand here is um is you know apply apply what we see and and just try to to keep you informed um robert do you have more to say here yes yeah, so, so i think we don't talk about it very often but we do have a a document called the congestion mitigation toolkit huge suite of projects or initiatives that can be used to question. And so not every one of those strategies fits into every community, right? But there are options out there, increased telework. You, you obviously have access to bike pad and improving those facilities, but evaluating um, growth in transit or getting micro. So there's a suite of options that are available to you and not everyone works in every community that, you know, we have to be context sensitive about how we're focusing on those strategies. Happy to discuss more about Hey, Mr. Papstorf. Thank you, Max and Robert. Just a couple of um, maybe wrap-up items. I think as we get into the middle of 2024 and kick off the, the uh, region's update to the long range regional transportation plan, which will we'll kick off next year. I think based on this conversation, it will be really important for us to come to you and talk about sort of how we do travel forecasting and how we use that tool, what that incorporates, how we forecast and how we do scenario analysis. We did a lot of scenario planning work the last time we developed uh, the 2050 regional transportation plan. It was really informative and really gave us the opportunity to evaluate sort of the impacts of different regional choices, both on the transportation investments that we make together and our land use and development pattern choices, right? And sort of how those interact and affect the outcomes as they relate to our regional goals around transportation, air quality, climate, all of those things. Um, so keep, stay tuned for that. I think that'll be really important for this group to ground that, right? Because I think you, you all had really good questions and comments launching off from this one piece, our, our congestion management report, into all of those bigger issues that span well beyond um, this. I think the other piece, the micromobility question is, is something that I'm personally really, um, is really creating some questions in my mind about the impacts on transportation. Because what we don't really know yet is how, how those micromobility systems are impacting transit and other trips. Are they, are they just adding more trips to the network that, that may not have existed? Are they replacing walk trips? Are they replacing transit trips? Um, or is it a new, new tool to help more people access transit? And are, and are we doing the things collectively to maximize the benefits of that system or not, and, I'm, and so we're still grappling with a lot of those questions. The good news is that we do have a really robust regional micromobility partnership program that Dr. Cog started with a number of local jurisdictions around the region to start to investigate that and manage that and talk collectively about how we implement and sort of manage the micromobility system. So a lot of those things all tie together and just wanted to make sure you were all aware that we are thinking about those things and we're working with all of our partners on those issues. Thank you. Robert and Max, thank you so much. Max, we thank look you. forward to having more presentations from you. Thank you. So I appreciate thank you very much. Appreciate you being here. We'll move ahead. To... Not everybody gets applause on their presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Moving ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Moving ahead to item number six, uh, the 2023 Active Modes Crash Report. Uh, Aaron Hillary, thank you. My apologies. Senior Active Transportation Planner, the floor is yours. Thanks for being here. All right. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so my name is Aaron Villery. I'm a Senior Active Transportation Planner uh, at Dr. Cog. Um, and I'm excited to present to you all today the Active Modes Crash Report, uh, which is an update on a report uh, that was last completed in 2019. 
And the purpose of the report, this really focuses on uh, crashes among uh, involving people bicycling and walking uh, throughout the region. So um, sort of a very uh, um, off of mind topic, I think, for a lot of us. And I'm excited to share some, uh, some data and findings from this report. Um, so what is the active modes crash report? Um, and so this is, this is an informational tool for us to use the regional crash data uh, that we get from the Colorado Department of Revenue and uh, CDOT um, to analyze crash trends and, and some of the underlying causes. Uh, and specifically, this report looks at the period between 2015 and 2019. Um, and uh, the reason for that is so that the previous crash report, the last time that this was completed was in 2019 uh, as an appendix to the active transportation plan that was adopted in that same year. Um, and that used uh, 2011 to 2015 data, so using a five-year period um, to uh, assess uh, bicycling and walking involved crashes around the region. And so um, we decided to do an update that looked at the 2015 to 2019 period for the very specific and intentional reason that 2020, a number of things changed. The crash report form itself changed but also uh, the COVID-19 pandemic really changed crash patterns. So we felt for the sort of most valid uh, analysis that we conduct using the five-year period immediately preceding the pandemic um, would give us the most uh, substantive findings uh, to understand regional crash uh, trends and causes. Um, talk a little bit at the end about what we did with, um, with one. Um, but really what, when we say active modes, uh, users, what we're, what we're referring to is people walking, and this includes uh, people uh, using mobility devices. Um, so anyone who is uh, coded as a pedestrian in the crash report, people bicycling, of course, um, and then people riding scooters are included in these crash reports as, as pedestrians using uh, toy vehicles. Um, so they are included uh, as pedestrians um, in this report, and that's uh, one of the things that the um, um, revision to the crash form uh, will change in years to come. But for 2015 to 2019, uh, we're really looking at walking, bicycling, and then people scooters in that pedestrian bucket. So um, the reason that, we, we, that this is a really salient topic, of course, is uh, just taking a quick look back over the last decade. Since 2010, um, uh, fatal and severe injury crashes among all modes have, uh, have gone up. Uh, but specifically uh, involving pedestrians, fatal and severe injury crashes went up 42% between 20 from 20. This is a pretty significant increase, and and I think something that we're all aware of and thinking about, um, and so want to have a little better information to um, really on um, crashes involving uh, people bicycling. The picture is actually quite a bit more complicated; that it was increasing. Uh, from pretty dramatically from the 2010 to 2014 region or um, time period, um, and then started to go down. Um, and wanna, wanted to peel that back a little bit. Um, and just to, to give you some numbers to it, so in 2010, there were 200 fatal and severe injury crashes involving pedestrians uh, in the Dr. Cog region, and that uh, number uh, increased to about 285 uh, by 2019. Um, so you can sort of see that, that increase here here. Um, among people bicycling, uh, that number, as you can sort of see, it, it, it does that, that hill and, and piece a little bit, but um, the numbers are a little smaller, so we want to be careful with drawing conclusions uh, from them. But something that we've noticed is, um, is that in, in the most recent years, um, there were fewer KSI uh, crashes, which is uh, people killed or severely injured, um, compared to 2014, but the number of uh, fatal crashes uh, increased slightly. So it went from about eight per year to about 13. So um, something that we're keeping an eye on in case of severity of bicycle involved crashes is, is increasing. Um, but the, the thing that makes this a really salient topic for all of us to be thinking about is that um, active mode involved crashes are about 3% of all crashes in the region, but about 22% of fatal and severe injury crashes around the region. Um, and uh, that's simply, uh, you know, in, in large part because people who are using active modes don't have vehicle design to offer them protection in the event of crashes. And so the severity tends to be greater uh, when people bike, biking and walking are involved in these crash events. And so they're overrepresented among uh, fatal incidents. 
And, and one of the key findings that sort of um, overarches all of this is that speed amplifies crash severity, and we see this across modes, but specifically um, with people walking, uh, as speed increases, severity of crashes really uh, increases dramatically. And so posted speed uh, was 35 miles per hour or greater. Crashes were uh, twice as likely to result in a fatality or severe injury than uh, at 20 miles per hour. Um, so you can sort of see that stair step of as speed increases on the street, um, the, the severity of crash events uh, just becomes that much more catastrophic. Um, for bicycles, um, for, for bicycle-involved crashes, uh, where the posted speed was 35 miles per hour or greater, uh, crashes were 50% more likely to result in the fatality or severe um, as a 20 miles per hour. Um, so again, you can sort of see a similar result that as speed increases um, and, uh, and severity uh, increases. And so the way that this uh, report is organized um, and some of the things that we're, we don't have time to go through all of it, unfortunately, today, but um, we want to go through sort of some of the high-level takeaways. Um, and the way that we organized is we wanted to look um, with our regional lens at who was involved and where did those crashes occur to try to understand if there are identity factors or demographic factors uh, that are impacting uh, risk for being involved in these active mode crashes. And then the, if there are specific things around roadway context or land use context or street types that um, at, are overrepresented among severe um, And so those are sort of the two frames that we'll look at really quickly for this. Um, so first, who was involved? And this is really trying to understand those demographic or identity factors um, that, that might indicate increased crash risk. Um, first, we looked at sex designation. Um, so one of the things that's important is um, prior to 2019 on Colorado State driver's licenses, the two sex designations, male and female. So that's what we're looking at with this report uh, of female uh, coded crashes. And we found um, that men were overrepresented um, among uh, people biking and, and uh, walking in, in crashes. And so um, two thirds of pedestrian involved fatal and severe injury crashes, uh, men were um, the participants, and then in three quarters of bicycle involved crashes. And what we know from, uh, from some regional uh, national studies is that for bicycling, men uh, actually do represent, this is a, a pretty similar uh, uh, demographic split co um, compared to ridership that about three quarters of, of men who are bicycling, um, we think in the region are men. Uh, as for pedestrians, uh, it's, it's a surprising finding that men are more likely to be involved and so uh, something that sort of merits further. We also wanted to look at age that we sort of know that, um, that children and older adults um, physiologically um, are, you know, uh, are more likely to have traumatic injuries uh, during these crash events. And so we wanted to understand if that was um, an indicator uh, regionally. And we found that people over 65 uh, we're 52% more likely um, than people aged 25, so uh, the middle adult age, um, to have crashes result in death or severe injury, so that these crashes for older adults are more traumatic. And finally, we used, um, we wanted to understand how demographic factors, and specifically trying to point to Dr. Cog's equity index, and to understand um, if certain demographic or sociological indicators um, indicated increased risk for biking and walking crashes. Um, and so we actually used the, uh, the um, equitable, um, equitable uh, Transportation Communities Explorer, which was uh, created by USDOT, um, which is an index of different demographic um, and socioeconomic factors um, uh, for uh, nationally, but at the census tract level, we want to understand if, if those facts that uh, had a higher index score um, had uh, increased crash risk. Um, and we found uh, there are three sort of indicator sets. Uh, so social vulnerability uses things like unemployment, um, household income, um, uh, poverty threshold uh, to uh, indicate social vulnerability, environmental burden um, uses things like uh, 
high-use facilities, um, pollutants, like that. Um, and then cost burden is, of course, how much a household is spending on transportation. And these are uh, these three different indexes are uh, were uh, three different maps. These are not necessarily the the map of the same areas within the region, uh, but all of those um, had significantly higher uh, pedestrian and, and bicycle uh, crash rates uh, and, and the lowest uh, keen tile. So um, uh, as sort of equity indicators increase and as risk increases uh, demographic factors, so does crash rate. Um, and then finally, we wanted to look at this question of uh, crashes where drugs and alcohol were suspected to just understand some of the user behaviors and human contributing factors. Um, and something that we found is that in, in pedestrian involved crashes, um, alcohol uh, being suspected among uh, users about one in five, which is uh, pretty high, but it was also pretty close, 17% in all other modes. Um, so we do think that uh, that alcohol uh, involvement uh, is is something that um, may be playing a role in crashes um, among all modes, um, and so something to keep. The other thing, and I'm I'm just going to kind of run through some very high level, you know, sort of nuggets of of information about where crashes did occur, um, but I'd encourage you all to to read the report for a lot more detail. But what we really wanted to do um, in this investigation about where crashes were occurring to, was to understand if there are certain road types or intersection types throughout the region that um, were indicating really acute risk for people biking and walking. And so we, um, what we did is, is we started with uh, looking at modes. So we looked at uh, pedestrian-involved crashes, and then we looked at bike. And we used uh, the area types developed during the regional Vision Zero. Um, action plan, um, and so that divides the region into urban, suburban, and rural area types. Um, and we wanted to understand sort of where on the street are those crashes uh, taking place, and are there specific types of streets or intersections um, there that are um, significantly more risky for walking uh, and bicycling. And what we found is regionally, uh, the majority of crashes involving pedestrians occur at intersections. Um, and that number increases as um, more urban and suburban locations. At those places on the roadway where there's conflict, there's more interaction. And so that's where we're seeing a lot more of the crashes. And just to pull out one, um, uh, so first of all, uh, when we were looking just at the, uh, or at the region as a whole, 41% um, of pedestrian involved intersection fatal and severe injury crashes involved left turns, and then 38% involved broadside collisions. So uh, cross-direction or, or perpendicular collision. So the, the majority of the crashes were either one of these two. And then specifically, um, we looked at intersection types. So among the intersection-involved crashes, we want to understand are there certain types of intersections where there are potentially common movements, common conflicts. And what we found is in urbanized locations, um, the major arterial of a local intersection uh, a third of all crashes were happening in that one intersection type. So you might think of a major, um, either an unsignalized or, um, or a signalized, but with permissive movement crossing. So a little narrow, uh, crossing a wider street. This is where a really significant number of crashes were taken. So um, a lot of those were either the broadside or the left turn crashes. So this might be um, people turning Cross a crosswalk with a permissive movement or um, uh, an unsignalized crossing, um, but something to uh, just be aware of that these major to minor crossings uh, accounted for a really a disproportionate number of. And then just kind of popcorning over to, to quickly look at bicycle fatal and severe injury crash locations. Um, uh, nearly two thirds, or yeah, nearly two thirds. Um, across the entire region occurred at intersections. Again, these are the points of great In urban areas, three quarters of um, intersections. And when we look at those, again, um, left turn movements and broadside movements accounted for a, a significant number of crashes, but we also noticed that with bicycles, um, especially in suburban contexts and that suburban area type, 
Uh, a third of the crashes involved right turn movements. And again, you can sort of see that um, the major to minor uh, crash or intersection type is where a significant number of those crashes is taken. Um, right turn movements emerge um, as a cause of a lot of these crashes. Finally, we wanted to understand some seasonal factors. Um, so we looked at uh, the hour of the day um, and then time of year. So starting by just looking at uh, crashes by, uh, by time of day throughout the period, and that um, bicycle crashes are really concentrated to peak hours that you can sort of see how it, it, uh, it trends up during the morning and then uh, that long commute. Whereas pedestrian involved crashes really increase during the afternoon uh, and evening hours. And so you can sort of see that as, as an activity increase that, um, that those crashes are also um, following along. And then finally looking at seasonality throughout the year, pedestrian crashes, uh, um, interestingly, really increase during the, the late fall and winter months. Um, that that's where you really see the pronounced increase, whereas bicycle crashes um, were really concentrated to the summer and early fall where, you know, where you have more um, uh, friendly travel weather for, for active transportation. So two really uh, different. Uh... And then uh, finally, the last thing, so I, I mentioned that we'd circle back to 2020 and 2020. Um, so uh, we did want to want to look at what was happening in the last two years, the first two years, uh, the years for which we have data uh, from the state. Um, and so uh, as as we all learned, um, uh, VMT is rebounding, that, that uh, travel patterns are rebounding uh, since the pandemic um, and are monitoring uh, what's happening with crashes. And what we found is that um, especially for um, pedestrian involved and then motor vehicle involved crashes, that those both rebounded faster than vehicle traffic. And so these are really pronounced problems as, as traffic returns that, um, that crashes are kind of surging and it's, it's becoming a very uh, acute issue that we all are keeping top of mind. Uh, and so with that, um, I, I strongly, I, I was only able to go through a, a you know, a, a small slice of what's included in the full crash report. So I uh, really want to encourage you all to, to dive in um, and, uh, and uh, that I'm ready to take questions and offer. Important information. Thank you very much. Mr. Welch. Well, I thank you for that presentation. And I, I think it's fascinating and cool that in the same meeting, Dr. Cog has a report on traffic congestion on roadways and active modes. Um, and I was just being nerdy and looking up, you know, 63% of all trips from the National Household Traverse Survey, and there's some Dr. Cog data wizards here that know this, are less than five miles. And 40% of all trips are less than two miles. Now think about those numbers and how many of them are being, you know, served by suburban assault vehicles. Oh, I mean, <laughs> suburban <laughs> utility, you know. So the, it, it's, I think we have, to, we have to look at our built environment and the roadway system that we have and this, you know, unspeakable carnage that's going on out there for, for cyclists and pedestrians. You know, you might have seen that Senator Fetterman, he's going to propose legislation nationally to do you know, do something about this. But I, I really commend Dr. Cog on keeping their eye on both of these issues at the same time because they're related to one another. And if we don't do more to deal with all these trips that really should be on another mode and they shouldn't be cars, we got to deal with freeway congestion. I get that. But for too long, I think collectively, we've ignored the fact that we're driving around way too much, and, and if we don't change both land use and the built environment and the transportation system, we got, you know, anyway, that's just my two cents worth. Thank you. Commissioner Adams. Uh, first of all, a very nice report. Thank you very much for, uh, for the data. Uh, two observations that I have about this, and one is um, I, I do worry about, you know, we have a lot of discussion about daylight savings time. And I thought it was interesting that when you looked at your chart, if I understood them correctly, certainly some of your pedestrian and bikes seem to happen at times when we might be in the midst of that change. And I know when I go walking, 
That is a concern of mine in the evening because I walk the same times of the day, but, but when I walk later in the day, it is dark. So, and the second point I want to make is, uh, is I do get concerned outside of the, of the downtown inner city area, the street lighting, that sometimes I feel like our street lighting in Denver it isn't a up to par with the street lighting in a lot of other major cities. And it has been commented to me by more than a few visitors who visited Denver that somehow we seem darker on some of our streets in the evening. So those are the two observations that I would make. I don't know if you've thought about that or looked at that, but those are two points I would make. Absolutely. Um, and uh, there, and unfortunately, my recall isn't good enough that I'm going to have exact figures for you. But uh, in the report, we, we do try to address um, or at least put some data to um, and and lighting is an issue. Darkness is an issue. Um, and and specifically those pedestrian crashes, um, we do sort of see them uh, concentrated to that time of day where the light is changing time of year. Find a specific correlation. I, I we even kind of did like a dive to see if, if the weeks and following daylight saving time had notably pedestrian crashes in the week prior and didn't notice any that, but you sort of shift where twilight comes in. And so, yeah, it's, uh, it's absolutely um, something that we've been talking about in, in our vision zero. Well, is, is More people in the queue. Uh, we'll go to Director Milby first, then Director Ward, uh, uh, Commissioner Holguin or Ms. Holguin, uh, and then uh, Mr. Tisdale. Thank you. Um, dovetailing on Brian's comments, I too was comparing the two reports and studies that we received as I was taking notes, and I I find that we need to consider the safety involved with the multimodal options when we're planning for those multimodal options and encourage funding for installing new multimodal options and the standard necessary to them. And that's ever more important when we have locations that are adding something. So if we're going to encourage adding multimodal options, then we need to make sure that we're funding those who are wanting to add those. Thank you so much for this overview. It's, uh, it's definitely something that we all need to be concerned about. Um, I'm curious, I mean, I'm, I'm excited to see the 2022 data and how it evolves because the, because of the increase in, in multimodal, especially with scooters and micro mobility. But I'm curious about this. I don't know about you all, men, but I mean, I'm concerned about the 77% and 67% um, rates. What are the contributing factors? Uh, has there been a deep dive? And I, I see your face a little bit nervous. <laughs> <laughs> Should I ask the men in the room to leave to have this conversation? Oh, no, I, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I, I guess I'm just curious about the, the um, it seems like an overrepresentation of um, a pedestrian and bicycle uh, fatalities or severe injuries um, when it seems like it's not necessarily just men on the road or not just necessarily men biking and uh, walking. And so I'm wondering if there's been a deep, deeper dive as to why this is. Yeah, um, one, um, so I'll preface this by saying that there are certain things like when we talk about the difference in ridership among like cycling populations that men seem to be bicycling at just a much higher rate than women are, that that would certainly um, uh, be a contributing explanation. My confidence interval down is, is and to other causes. There's some interesting research that um, that I think we we footnote in the report um, using things like travel diaries and near miss logs to sort of understand um, maybe incidents or things that discourage people from bicycling. Um, so there's a researcher in Aldred who's done some really interesting um, research and specifically for some of the safety and personal security. 
um, uh, factors that contribute to, uh, for instance, women being less willing uh, to bicycle in traffic um, that I think is, you know, that, that we're diving into. The pedestrian disparity is pretty surprising um, to us, certainly, that, that men um, uh, were so much more overrepresented among crashes. And I think it, it does merit a deeper dive um, because of some of the surrounding research travel differently. I think it could tend to be crash participants. Women are just smarter. <laughs> well, I asked for permission. <laughs> and I'm more patient, perhaps. Um, and, I, and I guess the second, um, I don't know that it's necessarily a question, but one of the, there are certain behaviors that I noticed on the road, and one is um, how we've forgotten what red arrows are. I mean, I was just turning here, and um, and the young man behind me just kept honking, and I'm like, I am not taking a red light for you, dude, especially when there's spikes. And so there, it seems like we might just need a reminder um, on the road. So I'm just curious about how we use this for education, pedestrian safety, and, um, and I guess just taking more precautions and education as we learn more about these factors. Thanks. I've made the comment before that, that lack of driver's ed and lack of, of some of those norms that many of us may have grown up with, uh, I think, do affect some of those things, just to editorialize. Director Tisdale, welcome. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to inquire about this. Um, it, it's a very good presentation, very interesting. Referring back to this same slide, uh, I think it's page 12 in your packet where you have the difference between male and female in the crashes. Do we have, by the same token, a male-female breakdown on the uh, operators, the vehicle operators in those crashes, because we focused here on the victims. What about the operators? How does that break down on a male-female uh, categorization? Yeah. So um, one of the shortcomings with um, data 2019 and prior um, is that it's consistent how it breaks down operators, and so it's sometimes like really hard to judge. Uh, who different crash participants are. This is something that, as the, 20, the, the new crash form in 2020, has much better information, has narrowed that in a little more. Sure. Um, but it, it's, it's a limitation of the data that we have that, that we're not able to uh, extrapolate the level of detail. Yeah, it's, it's a great question and, and something. Thank you. We often have people who don't mirror the experiences of the women we're asking about, and I would encourage thought, as I often do in Dr. Cog and other locations, to the fact that women are typically the ones who bring their children places and are needing to do that and cannot do it on a scooter or a motorcycle and often cannot do it on a bus or a train. That may be the single most big factor. Secondly, many women are discouraged, rightfully so, from utilizing multimodal transit um, and evening hours for safety and for going places for safety. Um, it is inherently a single occupancy mode of transportation and that is inherently unsafe for women of many ages. Thank you. Cook. Thank you. I'm sure you're doing this, but are you looking at vehicle weight as it increases as a factor in fatalities and so forth? Um, it was something that we wanted to do and will be able to do in uh, future reports with the improved crash form. Um, it was not something that, that we had enough confidence in had to be able to extrapolate something, um, extrapolate strong, but it, it's certainly something that um, to, you know, that we're, we're happy to have better data in the future to understand the way both with, you know, the most registered vehicles in the state are pickup trucks and, and standing that trend, but then a lot of 
emerging trends that we're going to be. Just for what it's worth, I read a report this morning that the, the, the gap in uh, expected life span for men and women is the widest it's been since 1996. And I, I was hesitating to say, but I think part of it is, I think in some cases, men may feel more invincible and the feeling about that vehicle will stop for me and find that that may not be the case. Uh, Director Guzman, and then we'll go to Executive Director Rex. Um, I wanted to say thank you for looking at the socioeconomic demographics. I think that that bears a lot of information, particularly in communities that might have been redlined and not have some basic infrastructure. And so when they're walking and they're biking, they have to do it in the road. Um, I'm thinking of communities like Galeria, Swansea, and Globeville here in Denver that I represent. Um, but there's plenty of examples everywhere. And it also is telling that, you know, intersectional uh, accidents are happening in urban and suburban areas, but they hugely decrease in the rural areas where it's going to be on roads without an intersection where there is probably not a sidewalk, probably not a safe way of passage because there's no route along some of those older highways or roads. Um, so I can't wait to dig into that information, but thank you for factoring that in. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Executive Director Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much, and thank you for the, the uh, conversation and to the great presentation today. I, I too, are very interested um, in in uh, you know as the data as we go forward, right? Because as we know, I mean, let's, we're facing it's a transportation revolution that's happening right now with regards to e-bikes. The ability for people to extend the the, amount, the trip to, um, based on just you know your your traditional pedal bike to e-bikes is significant. Our own Robert Spots, for example, I mean he commutes what seven seven miles, seven miles here, seven miles back daily. Um, and you know he's not he's not a sweaty pig when he gets here, right? So it makes a big difference, <laughs> right? We get a lot of complaints. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it is. Oh. But it, you know the simple fact is though, right? That folks are not going to use. They're not going to yeah. You know, they're not going to use facilities or they're not going to use that mode of transportation unless they feel safe. And I know there has been a lot of attention being placed on um, uh, protected uh, facilities for, for, for bicycle use. And it will be interesting to see how that plays out in the future, right? What the, what, you know, the crashes and where they're located, are they adjacent to uh, protected lanes or the like? That would be quite interesting. I'm actually, I'm, I'm interested in the fact that it's at intersection. It doesn't surprise me, but I don't know how protected lane solves that problem. Um, as someone who, who, who uses bicycle downtown a lot, like every day, I'm very aware of some of the concerns as was mentioned regarding the red arrows and the like, and I'm hypersensitive to that because I'm, um, you're right. It's about 50% of folks are not, are not stopping at red arrows. So we got to be careful. It's more of a public education campaign, but I'm very interested in this. I think e-bikes is it's the future for us, and we need to be able to be able to provide the infrastructure funding to get get projects done to make it more more readily available. You yourself, he drives. You should see this bike he has. It's it's a it's it's like a boat. I've ever seen like it. <laughs> it's this bike, and it's got this what do you call it? Some Cargo bike, yeah, we have, you can put two kids in it. And that's the other thing, right? They're becoming more and more shared trips on bikes. And there's a concern about the safety associated with that, too. And I know you probably think about it every day as you pick up kids. So, um, so I'll just leave it there. Thank you. Dr. Williams. Um, but interestingly, the offset, the fastest growing population in Denver are older adults. And those people are not using scooters. And, and unfortunately, not enough of them are riding bikes, um, even though they're e-bikes, even though some of us older adults mentioning no names ride our bikes all the time. But that offset to the number, uh, the increase that we're seeing in multimodal. So uh, I'd be interested to see how that balance plays out as we move forward. Karen, thank you very much for the presentation. Another applause, Ernie. Thank you for being here. We appreciate it. Uh, moving ahead to member comments and other matters real quick. If you park downstairs, remember to get your parking uh, 
get out of jail free uh, ticket. Uh, and then we'll go to reports. First, we'll start with the Colorado Department of Transportation. Commissioner. I can take the first stab at it and then I'll hand it over to other commissioners or Darius. Uh, so we had a, a really good, we've had a couple of uh, really good meetings at the Transportation Commission. As I mentioned, I think it was last time we have um, uh, several, six new commissioners. And so this has been a really wonderful opportunity to take a step back and look at the really big picture. And so we hosted a, uh, a an all-commission retreat where we were able to get um, some really good ideas as to what could be helpful. And so the, the department organized a deep dive on our budget to better understand all of the sources of revenue and how those connect to the projects and how when our constituents say, what about doing this or what about investing in this, that we can say this is how all of these dollars can be used or not used. And so I'm um, really excited about that. We have a, a two more days, two days that are going to be really, really full. We have some really um, uh, critical decisions right now. We have uh, the 24-25 uh, proposed budget allocation plan that we'll be discussing tomorrow. We have some, um, the Crystal Valley uh, Interchange uh, 1601 decision. Um, uh, we also have the now the newly established the fuels impact enterprise, so establishing articles of incorporation bylaws and things like that. Um, so we have we also have a a, um, a dinner with uh, Move Colorado uh, tomorrow. So really really full days. We also had some uh, some really interesting or exciting uh, opportunities yesterday. There was a ribbon cutting um, ceremony on I-70 and 32nd Whitridge. Uh, it was really exciting to hear that that project was on time, within budget, actually slightly under budget, So, which is so rare to hear nowadays with inflation and everything else. Um, also had the, the BRT um, uh, launch. Uh, so it's uh, a lot of movement, a lot of excitement, and a lot more work to come. So anything else you want to add? Um. A couple of comments that I would just add to uh, uh, Commissioner Hogan's uh, comment. That one, it's important for all of you to know that uh, one of the initiatives that we're working on is we're taking a hard look at fiber and connectivity throughout the state. We have a, a very large fiber network available to us, and so one of the uh, tasks we were commissioned uh, by the governor's office to do was to really take a look at pricing on fiber and how do we make – and this, this is really – an opportunity that could have direct benefit to VMT and other matters in terms of just uh, easing the burden that people may feel on having to get into their vehicles in order to do things. So we, we think we've come up with something that looks like a reasonable rate that will be hopefully attractive to people that we expect to vote on, I think, in December is, uh, is to vote on something. And then the second thing that we've getting, had a lot of conversation about has to do with uh, – the realignment of stack and our it doesn't affect dr cog and i know you're probably happy about that but it's creating a lot of uh a lot of conversation amongst those uh stack members who might be affected by some realignment and so we've had several months of really some interesting input on that so those are two things i would just add thank you Thank you. Um, first, want to welcome Commissioner Cook and Commissioner Vasquez to the RTC. Appreciate having you here and and uh, um, more uh, monthly meetings uh, to come. And um, uh, I would just add on to that that in addition to what was already been said, it's kind of getting into a little bit of the slow season with the holidays coming. But uh, the uh, the study that Commissioner Adams has mentioned that is going to be a, a big topic that is going to be discussed at. Uh, the commission with potential recommendations that was already discussed at stack last month and um, any action to be taken by that will be um, will be taken up uh, early next year and um, unrelated to CDOT but uh, related to state government in general there is a special session primarily focused on property taxes so I uh, wanted to note that as well before we get into the actual regular season uh, regular legislative season starting in early January and with that, that concludes our reports, Chair. Thank you very much. We'll move ahead to RTD, the Regional Transportation District. Who wants to uh, 
So I will first defer to any of our board members and General Manager Johnson, who had to leave for a meeting, has given me some notes to share, but I will first ask any of our directors to um, share anything that they would like to. Okay. Um, General Manager Johnson wanted me to mention that the Zero Fare for Better Air draft report has been submitted to the Colorado Energy Office and we are awaiting comments. You can take a look at that. Because it's on our brand new website that is launching tomorrow night, this website was built using Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 2.2. It incorporates a third-party tool to provide more support for users who need accessibility assistance, and the content will be available in English, Spanish, and Chinese. The other thing I'll just mention is the Board of Directors will be considering starting tonight, and then as a full board later this month, the 2024 operating budget one of the most notable items in there is part of our focus on back to basics and state of good repair. They are going to be uh, asked to consider $150 million, which is a big number for, for RTD, uh, specifically related to dealing with the aging rail infrastructure all the way from the Auraria campus to 30th and Downing in the downtown loop. So stay tuned. That would be a very major project for the agency, but one that, as you know, if you've been around, we started in 1994, and a lot of that track needs to be rehabilitated. And rather than spread it out, I think the, the, the board has emphasized we need to do this and we need to get it done. It, it will not be easy, but we'll be working very care closely and collaborating with all of our partners to minimize the disruption to our customers. But that's what I had. And if I can just uh, footnote that, uh, because I chair the Finance and Planning Committee, and we'll be bringing that forward tonight at our Finance and Planning Committee meeting. And uh, yes, the goal is to try to do all of this work in 2024. And I think that's because we realized that the uh, upheaval on the 16th Street Mall wasn't quite enough, and so we thought we to do that. So please don't hold it against us. Director uh, Guzman. The, the proposed uh, addressing of the aged infrastructure also includes the canternary wires and other infrastructure along that, not just the rail. Um, so that's really important to keep in mind. It's that the whole system holistically needs to be dealt with um, to, to do the proper repairs to keep people safe. And Deborah's commitment to protecting customers and, and our writers and the public is forefront in this goal uh, for next year. Also, with respect to the website, we are starting with the three languages, but we do recognize 21 protected status languages. And those can come online fairly quickly in short order as they are requested by the public um, to do so uh, in our work. And so that's really important. It's not using a translator to translate what's written in one language. This is actually done for the whole system uh, about the website. So that's a really key feature of this update that I am really, truly excited about. It provides a lot of access and equity. Thank you very much. I can't believe I forgot this since I was at the, uh, at the ceremony for this, but you know, last week we announced over at CDOT Bus Rapid Transit, an initiative that really I think is exciting for all of us in the metro area, and I just, I can't believe I, I failed to mention it completely, but I do. It's a great partnership between Dr. Cog and RTD and CDOT that I think will really have, uh, bring a lot of value and a lot of benefit to citizens of the metro area. So forgot to mention it. Sorry Thank about that. No worries. Thank you very much. And uh, Regional Air Quality Council, sir. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, just want to let the let the group know of the uh, the plans at the Regional Air Quality Council for new programs, our expanded programs, and then our our research areas for um, air quality improvement. So we'll be. Um, We'll be expanding our efforts for an, a vehicle high emitter identification maintenance and repair program with monies. Um, most of these monies do come from Dr. Cog in our um, in our in our set aside program, 
And so we're pleased to uh, uh, be in the, the final um, stages of planning uh, more outreach in that area, along with um, more intensive anti-idling campaigns around schools and in and, and other locations. Uh, we will continue our work for um, oil and gas and lawn and garden equipment, um, emission controls, and, um, and improvement in, in those areas. And then we'll be focusing on some new areas, um, looking at um, building and appliance emissions and how they contribute to our, our, our air quality issues, and also what are called indirect sources. Indirect sources are those large either trip generating or trip attracting activities that we have, whether it's a, um, a, a ballpark on, on game day or a, um, a large warehouse distribution center that um, is, is providing all those services directly to our, our residents and our, and our places of work that uh, we didn't have 10 years ago and 15 years ago that are now a really large part of our, of our infrastructure and the use on, on our highways and our roadways. And so how do we um, gain emission reductions in that area? So RAC will be just launching a whole a new array of, of research and program offerings. And I wanted to let the group know. Great, thank you very much. Any other matters by members? Seeing none, our next meeting is December 19th. We'll see you then. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you so much for being here and for all you do.